welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Alessio, from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Alessio. Hi, everyone. Audrey. Hey, hey. And I'm your host, Fen. We're going to be talking about a range of different topics from across the hobby. And we'll start today as we always do with the standee start today as we always do with the standee catch up. So what's everyone been up to eh, since we last recorded? Uh, well, here I'm doing pretty okay. Uh, I've been playing uh, with Alexis our campaign of uh, the King's Dilemma, which is soon play yet. Uh, so I'm very looking forward to the ending because it's getting at a point where it's dragging a bit, honestly. We like the mechanics, but it's getting long. Uh, last Sunday, I played with my parents on Tabletop Simulator because we all got it. And we played the crew, so I explained them the game. And we played, we had a few mom had issues uh, setting up properly. <laughs> so we lost a bit of time there, but I mean, that's parents. <laughs> and uh, they're coming to visit me at the end of May. And I got them a Codex Naturalis, which I think they will like because it's small it's a simple game and we might play together when they come so i'm really looking for what <laughs> i i got a lot of packages which were stuck i guess in the suits canal but uh, i got uh, mariposas from elizabeth argrave and i'm eager to have a try at it and i got sherlock holmes consulting detective the the new edition i tried the uh, thames murder and a couple of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, the, the new edition. I tried the uh, Thames Murder and a couple of folders. And uh, I'm proud to say that I'm uh, going the wrong deduction all the time. I completely messed up the first two cases. So I, I'm off to a good start. <laughs> Congratulations, you sex. Messed up the first two cases. So I, I'm off to a good start. <laughs> Congratulations, you six successfully emulated the London police in all of the Sherlock Holmes novels. Yeah, I am extremely competent. Yeah. So, <laughs> Is, isn't Holmes such like such a pompous smug git at the end of Consulting Detective? The, the Pete Holmes uh, YouTube series, uh, you, you have to, to watch them. They are super cool and fun. <laughs> all, all Holmes deductions are pompous and they can be horribly wrong. So it's a it's a cool watch. Pete Holmes on YouTube. <laughs> on my end, uh, I mostly played King's Dilemma, dragging on a little bit, uh, mainly because there's not a lot of interaction between your family's given goal and the game themselves. Uh, from one game to the other, there's not a lot of um, uh, long-term things happening. Uh, it feels kind of um, show away sometimes. Once that your the goals that you're given. Uh, to get your prestige point, you can mostly ride out the rest of the game. And I think that some family-dependent dilemma might have made it more involving. Uh, either way, we, we are to have it finished by our next episode, so um, looking forward to that. Outside of that, uh, either way, we, we are to have it finished by our next episode, so um, looking forward to that. Outside of that, uh, nothing super interesting. My roommate's been very excited about the new expansion for the Binding of Isaac card game uh, that will hit pre-order soon. Expansion for the Binding of Isaac card game uh, that will hit pre-order soon. Um, what about you, Fen? Hang on, which hang on, which game was that? Uh, the Binding of Isaac uh, card game. Right, okay, yeah, Repentance landed recently. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I, I've i seen that played a bit. It's a lot of effects have strong and wild effects, but because of the games are short, the randomness mm. is a, of a crazy broken combo is just fun rather than frustrating. Oh, well, if you can have a game like that, you do want it to be short. It's fine for stuff to be silly and broken and somebody just runs away with it if you're not there for 30 minutes or so. Yeah, it's between um, 10 and 20 minutes, being mostly fun and short um, and about making strategy on the fly. Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, sounds... Well, I, I've watched people play it um, and I've, I've really enjoyed uh, Mind of Isaac. I think it's just roguelite um, of its style out there. You know, the action... Uh, um, dead cells. <clears throat> hmm? 
Dead Cells. Dead Cells, yeah. D- Dead Cells is is no, nah, Dead Cells isn't as good as Isaac. Dead Cells is very enjoyable. Um uh but I would I but put it Okay, I beg to defer. I mean it kind of is I think it's definitely within the genre but all I know is I played it for a while and have just shunted it off into the I'm not playing list for a long time whereas Isaac continues to be something I pop on and play every month or so or more at the moment it spends at 200 hours of content If we have to sort for by just quality I'd say that uh, Aedis it's probably the best. I'd get Hades second place. Yeah, the, the problem is that the, the, the game... Place. Yeah, the, the problem is that the, the, the game eventually will exhaust his, uh, his content. Because mm. it's a single story. But, but it is good because they knew where to stop. So well, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, Hades has a really well-defined, well-done game loop. And it's... You know, pretty fantastic. Hades has a really well-defined, well-done game loop, and it's you know, pretty fantastic at that. But um, uh, it's just, uh, well, you know, for me, it'll always be Binding of Isaac. It's like the one that's just had the biggest staying power and is iterated and innovated on itself so many times. The new is iterated and innovated on itself so many times. The new content has alternate versions of every single character in the game. And they introduced two new characters, so it's like pretty crazy. And some of those new characters are very like trying to get your head around how they play is um, bizarre. They've just um, bizarre. They've totally flipped mechanics on their head. They added the whole true ending. They've given the series an actual f- definitive finish now. Um, with the close on the story, a really nice close. I wasn't expecting it to be as well done and as touching as it was. So anyway, this isn't a get along. Yes, just a chit chat. Yep. Uh, we had um, we had some exciting fun with Games Workshop, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was keeping this for la- for last. Uh, actually, what happened last week? <laughs> uh... Uh, Cursed City, Warhammer Quest, the new edition in the Age of Sigmar, but I recap for uh, for for anyone who wasn't listening or checking the news or checking board game communities. But what happened in these few weeks is that uh, a new Warhammer Quest was, ba- was bound to be out and it went to pre-order. It's Warhammer Quest Cursed City. A new edition set with uh, undeads as villains and set in the in the realm of Sh- Shaish <laughs> and Shish? in the city of Ul- of Ulfenkarn anyway. And uh, basically, uh, this game went on pre-order at eleven of Saturday, or uh, I guess three of three of April, third of April. Yes, and uh, and. It went uh, uh, sold out in less than an hour. I think that a few copies in uh, very localized languages like uh, Italian or something like that uh, survived for two hours, but nothing more than that. And it went completely sold out. The next week, when when it should have gone on uh, a full order, it actually wasn't sold. It wasn't delivered to to the to the stores, which only got the pre-orders they ordered in advance in uh, in a in a lessened number than they ordered, and the 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 game is not available and available anymore. Is officially out of production because Games Workshop put out a tweet saying that if you want Cursed City you have to go to third party stores and uh, get it because they won't sell it anymore. So <laughs> what happened? Is, is it Games Workshop? Games Workshop at the third party store? What is happening? No, nobody, nobody knows. Like it's bizarre that it would uh, land on, you know, like for me, I was waiting for it to arrive at my local store, and I had it like on reserve, and they just went, oh, um, sorry, it's, uh, we're not even getting any copies in, and I was like, oh, okay, all right, like fancy key to Ulfenkarn that everyone who was pre-ordering was getting, and that was meant to be the bonus for for pre-ordering, um, yeah, just. 
the, the the vapor game like instant vaporware this is a new level of limited edition yeah and that that is extremely strange because i actually received my copy written now i i want the quote exact english because i have the italian edition but it says the this is the first adventure in the city of Wolf, wolfenkarn of many others like it was expecting to be expanded so uh i checked on reddit communities these days and and they they all say no it's a screw up it was intended to be a limited edition for sure it doesn't sound like that uh, and no. of course inside the box there is also an errata for assembling the dwarf like uh, it was ready for mm, i think a couple of weeks and they just in the final stages uh, understood that they needed to add an errata so it doesn't look like something that didn't didn't need support or extended support or something like that this is probably one of those things that like years down the line some ex-member of staff will finally just see what happened um, yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah, be that... like, "What? Why?" Th there might there might be a combination of Brexit, of the COVID pandemic that played a part there, but at least the community should know things and not wait more than a week to know things. So, uh, this this was one one of the first theories that were crafted, but actually, uh, if you go on the on, on the English. Uh, uh, for example, why is it gone in the US website where there's no VAT or Brexit or something like that? And also, you can order everything else from the Games Workshop, order everything else from the Games Workshop web store from Europe and from anywhere else, and you get the, the banner at the top of the page when say, we got VAT covered for you, you don't worry about taxes, we will pay for you. So uh, it is just a thing that... Uh, uh, that uh about taxes we will pay for you so uh it is just a thing that uh, co uh that uh that is involves cart city and this is w this is uh, very strange uh of course uh it is not helping the fact that the game actually got two bad reviews one from the fact that the game actually got two bad reviews one from uh, drive through reviews and one uh, which is actually uh, very very recent at the moment of recording this podcast from always bored never bored but uh, uh, i i mean uh, economically it it has no se it makes no sense because it went uh, sold out in less than an hour i don't know the exact story here but um could this be a copyright conflict where the, they own the IP, but maybe not some of the text material or some of the artwork or something? In in the credits, uh, apparently I don't ha I I didn't buy it, so uh, that's from her. Side, but I think that uh, I saw someone say that in the credits they credit the Warhammer team and they don't credit individual people. So fight might be something. Yeah, exactly. That could be uh, a case. And uh, is that? Uh, I was checking the entire backstory and everything, and actually they only referenced the, their IP and from Age of Sigmar, so it's entirely proprietary uh, as ma uh, for as far as I can tell. And uh, the other cool thing is that uh, uh, you could see that there is some something similar, for example, to Darkest Dungeon in the way uh, you possibly go on expedition and prepare for the final assault and etc etc but the fact is that this kind of mechanics cannot be copyrighted so uh, this is possible but it's still weak i don't know i think ultimately we just kind of have to shrug and be like well if you really want the game pay through the nose on the secondary market if you couldn't manage to get there otherwise blackstone fortress is still really good yeah, and also Blackstone Fortress, which is the earlier game with a similar, it's still there and it, it gets a reprints over reprints. So, of course, uh, I, I have a distinct opinion, but I will have to play it. I have the distinct opinion that Blackstone Fortress is the superior one still. <laughs> But uh, but again, it's still printing money because there's a lot of this game. 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's always been a demand for Warhammer Quest ever since it first came out and went out of print, and then there was a resurge in demand and interest, and they've kept trying to iterate on the original 1995 game. They've never really come close. Blackstone Fortress is the closest that they've they've got. They've got. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, uh, who knows? It's, it's a complete mystery, but uh, how about we move on to a, another um, product which is going to be available, and that would be It's a Wonderful Kingdom. Yeah, It's a Wonderful Kingdom from La Boîte de Jeu, and I can say it without any accent. If Boîte de Jeu, and I can say it without any accent, if that isn't wonderful. Uh, the, the Kickstarter is currently going on. Uh, I put my pledge in uh, after two or three days, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's I like these kinds of Kickstarters from La Boîte de Jeu because you have everything from the start. You know that you have everything from the start. You know there won't be surprise add-ons, you know... Uh, you, you know that what you get at the start is what you will pay at the end. And it just gets slightly better. You don't have uh, huge straight goals. You don't have huge stuff uh, like tons of miniatures added. It's one card here uh, or three cards here from uh, a module, etc. I think it's very sleek the way they, they do it. And they... they ace their packaging all the time you have two boxes you can get the standard box which will be the retail box and you can get the special box with all the little uh, boxes inside to um, to organize the, the game and everything and i think the, the it's really one of their major points and if you are French like me, if you are living in France like me, you can order your copy to be delivered at your local game store which doesn't cost you anything in shipping so I, I mean yeah i'm boasting a bit there but i really like how they do things and it, it's very simple the stretch goals are according to number of backers which is more convenient to do when you just have two pledging tiers this uh, mechanic is completely brought over in uh, it's a wonderful kingdom so it's uh, a thing it's a kickstarter uh, i will keep an eye on of course, uh, I'm spending all my money this year, so uh, actually I, I have to be considerate. But, uh, you know, this is the last time, right, Audrey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not pledging any other game this year. I said, Sanko Kushin doesn't count because even I would be pledging just for minis, not for the game. So it doesn't count. I can do it. Uh, that's not bad face. <laughs> But I mean, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful world if you just want to get the, the basic version. You, you, it's 30 euros for the deluxe version. It's 50 euros. So I, I mean, it's a budget-friendly game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we will see ne ne next episode what will be your last game this year. No, not yet. <laughs> There's always room for one more last game of the year. Yeah, I, I will try not to just to win the bet for my bad faith. No, of course not. Yes. Yeah, your 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 last Yeah, your 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 last game will be when your credit card will get rejected. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um I I I myself I I think the it's a wonderful XXXXX series. I wanted to say more X's then because I didn't want to say it with three X's. Um XX series. I wanted to say more X's then because I didn't want to say it with three X's. Um uh, is something that I think looked quite interesting, but I just know I'm never going to get to play it. So I'm kind of like just just put my fingers in my ears and being like, no, 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 la 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 la. I've already got... Even the solo mod. Oh yeah, I've got so many games to play solo. Yeah, I've got so many games to play solo as well. You know, like okay. like a lot of solo games. Yeah. Although I can tell you one thing, I'm not playing Oath solo again because the AI in that is not very good you you shouldn't a actually I, I have only good things to say about I'm i am getting convinced that that game will play good extremely good only on four player count uh i, I, I played in three and it's interesting but the people has to work to make it interesting i played it in five it's a bit too messy for me but it still runs in six i, I have no idea in six exclusively and it's been like uh, it's been the players that have made the game. Uh, the the game itself, it, it, I, I, we're not going to get into Oath in details right now, but uh, we'll probably talk about it in the future. I want to give it more time. 
Um, I think bizarrely, considering who it comes from, the trouble is the world feels empty and hollowed out and like just lacking in any kind of any character, really. Which is incredible to think to say that with because we've got Kyle Ferrin's fantastic art and Cole like Cole, the 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 world that Cole created for Root is just incredible, like the amount of background and everything in just you can draw background and everything in just you can draw from it just from how everything plays. So I need more time to play with it. The physical copy is definitely a better experience than the tabletop simulator one, but when I did my um my like followed through the process of like setting the game up for the next year or next place like setting the game up for the next year or next play session i was like is that it really i can see how this is going to iterate going ahead and it's really gonna with the right group of people it's gonna sing but for the average person i don't think it's gonna be particularly great uh of course uh, uh with average person probably root would be a, uh with average person probably root would be a better hit and uh, i wouldn't recommend root to the average person anyway well uh we should probably now get on to our actual topics we're going to be uh on theme today we've got uh, we've got a monster kick theme going on as in just about every single one we've got uh, we've got a monster kick theme going on as in just about every single one of these games has gribbly creatures and was on kickstarter uh, we're starting with one that just finished recently um and that is from steamforge games monster hunter world not the video game um, which I've enjoyed a great deal, but finally going to be adapted into a board game. Um, Monster Hunter, made by the people at uh, Steamforge Game. It's the team behind Dark Souls, Resident Evil, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, every game that they make seems to be uh, better every time and responding to um, player feedback. So I'm really excited about the Mon Hunt board game. Yeah, yeah. Dark Dark Souls people said um, my brother has Dark Souls, and he was very much like it's kind of not great up until you fight the bosses, and then it's really good. Um, and then they, until you fight the bosses, and then it's really good. Um, and then they it, they listen to feedback. The the expansions arrived uh, as well, and um, it's become a better a better game overall. So this is a cooperative complex AI battler in which you play as a hunter wielding one of them. And um, it's become a better, a better game overall. So this is a cooperative complex AI battler in which you play as a hunter wielding one of the 14 different weapons in the game. And as you hunt, you first have a choose your own adventure that serves as a tracking quest. And, and as you hunt, you first have a choose your own adventure that serves as a tracking quest and gives you some extra material uh, and maybe influence the fights that will come, as well as allow you to uh, define the behavior of the monster a little bit later. And then you take on the large monster in a showdown that will have its very own personality and a different way to fight and sometimes different mechanics. Um, and straight up, I have to say, this is a perfect fit for Monster Hunter. An AI battler with the monster at the center of the game, their quirks and attitude being what dictate the pace of the fight. It's supposed to be all about positioning and knowledge for that. But uh, it's no surprise given that Monster Hunter is what inspired complex AI battler in the first place. So the circle is finally complete now. Now, before we get onto the good part, uh, mainly the gameplay, I need to rant for just a second. Um, I'm really disappointed for this game. I understand that uh, it was the best selling game at the time, but I feel like with an entire franchise, it's kind of unfortunate that they only picked the most recent and less reminiscent of the whole game. Um, for example, a lot of the monsters that they have of them, um, they ignored fan favorites that will either be part of the Iceborne expansion um, or that were part of the franchise beforehand. And those I would have loved to have a, as a miniature or play with them on the board but I don't have as much at all. Um, I feel it's limiting uh, to pick the most restrictive, uh, restrictive game, especially that um, 
Monster Hunter World also had the least interesting design in, ter in terms of uh, weapons and armor, um, a lot of them being to the older design. And I feel that it's kind of a shame that the base miniatures that we have for the board games are often going to be those least interesting ones, even though they could have picked um, the ones that are more iconic and associated with the game. Uh, for example, the, um, the ones that are more iconic and associated with the game. Uh, for example, the Rathalos armor or the Diablos armor, for example. It's kind of a shame to see just the least interesting weapons to have been picked up, uh, especially since they clearly had some material to choose from. Some material to choose from, but that's that's my, my biggest problem with the game. Either way, visual aside, the game has some great gameplay to itself. Well, a bit before you get into that, I do, I do want to just say as a counterpoint, um, like Monster Hunter World, the, the, the game, is that's the first Capcom game to break fifth something like... Uh, last I checked, maybe like nearly 17 million copies of the game have sold. So I, I, I get the, yeah, they, they need to get past that first barrier of this is like, hey, video game players, check out this board game. And the, a lot of like PC players, all they know is Monster Underworld, Monster Underworld, you know. So, but I, I, I tell you one thing right, that I do not like is the Kula Yaku and Teostra being Kickstarter exclusives. Yeah, for sure. Um, Gameplay-wise, uh, there's a lot of good things, though. The gameplay-wise, uh, there's a lot of good things, though. The gameplay can be played either as a mini campaign, with each monster that you slay allow you to create a craft better gear until you fight a buffed-up version of one of the monsters, uh, or a single-shot fight with recommended gear for each monster level, which I find extremely clever. This is really clever and smart because they've offered up, hey, single session, here you go, want to fight, you know, you got your mates, and like, hey, you, you, you know Monster Hunter we play, you want to come around and like fight a Rathalos or fight an Anjath? Like, you remember the first time you fought one of those in Monster Hunter World? Ooh. Um, but also, the campaign length is looking manageable campaign length is looking manageable and it's looking like it's going to sit in this sweet spot between townsfolk tussle that can usually be like maybe one or two sessions and the other stuff which is like hey you're here for several months maybe longer and i i think that is really sweet the space of length that they've nailed here is length that they've nailed here is this is a gap that um i've actually been talking with um I, with with uh, Matt at Geektopia Games about this is the the length of campaign we should aim for, you know, when we do our stuff. Uh, if you own multiple of the expansion that they are uh, offering in the kick the expansion that they are uh, offering in the Kickstarter, you can combine them with specific rules that make the campaign a little bit longer. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot to highlight about the game, but one system that I think is really interesting would be their weapon system, with each weapon coming with a different damage. Instruct you to draw a certain number of uh, damage cards, and that damage deck will be, uh, you know, more geared towards uh, higher damage for some of the weapons, for example. Um, so you have a board in which you're going to line up your uh, attack and to do a specific amount of damage and th that mirrors the system of combo that you have in the in the base game and that's an interesting way to do it uh, i'm going to do a very bad job at explaining it uh, orally but i would um, instruct anybody to, to to look at the kickstarter and look at how they're playing at that one thing, one other thing that I think is really interesting is that the monster's uh, attack will determine how many cards uh, the players can play in a row and how many players can act after the monster attack. So some uh, monster attacks will not let a big opening over uh, their entire hand and really wail onto the monster. And like finding the pacing of the monster and understanding which attack are going to be more open is really important. Um, yeah, when it's the player's turn, they need to keep an eye on their stamina to know how many cards they can from the cards they already played. Um, it's It all looks really interesting and fun to play with, and I cannot wait to get my hands on this. I, I, lo I love 
yeah, sorry. I, I, there's so much more. I love the elemental damage bit as well. Uh, which um, I watched the uh, Nogagante fight um, um, that they did. They only managed to do three rounds against it, but like I was already impressed with the mechanics in that they showcased off the elemental damage, which is it's it's basically just a, a token that builds up, and when it reaches a certain threshold, you get you get to deal extra damage. But um, that's a great way of representing it without making it too powerful. Representing it without making it too powerful. One of the things I always noticed in these games is it's really hard to do like weaknesses because you, you're dealing with such small numbers that double damage or plus one or plus two damage is a lot. And they kind of got around through that, which I'd love. The the whole customization of the deck thing, the, the whole customization of the deck thing, um, that's in Horizon Zero Dawn for the Hunters. It's different there, but it is one of the most fun things about Horizon Zero Dawn is getting new cards into your Hunter deck and changing the way that you do your combos and, and bits and pieces. And this is... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they also um, they they they've given all the bases a little cross on them. So depending on where you attack, the physiology card will tell you what locations you can pick to attack. So you can actually aim to try and break the tail or break the claws or the wings or the head. Uh, and Nogagante has an additional uh, mechanic where uh, just like you know, uh, mechanic where uh, just like when you fight it, it gains um, spikes. It spikes harden. And so you're looking to also try and break those spikes off a location to stop it dive bombing, um, which is really like it was great to see that mechanic brought from the fight and translated so cleanly. Um, I do think while we're briefly talking about the AI, we're briefly talking about the AI, we have to mention the best thing that they've done for AI cards, which is the backs of the AI cards. Brilliant. Absolute genius. Okay. So the backs of the AI cards have three pieces of information on them. One of them's obvious. It's the symbol for the and what its target is. So you don't get to know exactly what it's going to do, but you get a clue and you know what it's going for. Yeah. So all of a sudden there's positioning becomes strategic because you can maneuver to try and figure out who it's going to attack. You even get some clues like if you see the the, the torso for the Great Jag focused in the fuzziness of the random deck a bit further to allow people to be strategic and make educated guesses. I would probably suck at that game just as much as I suck at the video game due to that. <laughs> I, um, I think I think one of the advantages here is you've got a bit more time to play slower, whereas when you play the video game, if you can't internalize and react to the signal parts of the attacks, it can be a bit uh, frustrating. It's fair that it's easier for my um, playmates to help me on a board game than on a video game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, Monster Hunter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, Monster Hunter. Oh. Uh, the uh, pledge manager opens in a month and you can jump in uh, back into the game in... Uh, well, I guess when this episode mm -hmm. comes out, it will probably be three weeks, something like that. Uh, keep an eye on it if you're interested, if you like the game. Uh, like that. Uh, keep an eye on it if you're interested, if you like the game. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yep, yeah, I'm just going to jump in and say, if you do decide to, pledge responsibly, as always, um, but either go for the pledge that gives you access to all the base game which will have four monsters plus an alternative for the rathalos um yeah so it, just um either it's like 102 pounds or it's 211 pounds you know your equivalent afterwards uh so just be sensible with that but um those are the two and you just want the models yeah, I know a few friends which were like, oh, I see all these monsters that I love. And I had a look at the miniatures as well, because uh, around the board gaming uh, uh, crowd, there are many people that are often intimidated uh, when they buy a board game with miniatures. And like, there are many people that are often intimidated uh, when they buy a board game with miniatures. And they're like, oh, I want to try painting, but I'm not sure what I can do, etc. If it will look nice, etc. And based on the render, I think that the minis are majorly textured, which is something very nice for the minis are majorly 
textured which is something very nice for beginners which would be able to use uh, zenithal priming even with spray cans, contrast paints, dry brushing to a reasonable effect. And so I think that uh, people that might hesi hesitate, hesitate to get this due to oh, the minis are too big or something like that can get away with it. So I think that's something really friendly. Of course, masters in painting will, uh, will uh, paint jobs that will make our jaws drop, but even for someone that's uh, just a hobby, it's completely uh, easy to do, and for someone that's a beginner, there are lots of techniques to be used to get something nice on the table. Yep, and indeed, and uh, going from one setting where huge giant screams dominate the, uh, the landscape to one where nobody can hear you scream, comes Nemesis. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is part of my path of repentance towards uh, Awaken Realms, so I have to be extremely <laughs> careful about what I say. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I will begin with this. Nemesis is uh, listed as a 2008. I will begin with this. Nemesis is uh, listed as a 2018 game, but it's actually uh, it actually begin sh began shipping in uh, uh, 2017. So uh, this is uh, a game from Awaken Realms designed by Adam Kopinski. So uh, this is uh, a game from Awaken Realms designed by Adam Kopinski. Is isn't that a fun name? His surname, sorry. I really love his surname. It's it's such good flow. Kopinski. Anyway, carry on. I, 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 these years because it got it got a lot of uh, nominations uh, and it had a couple of issues. Uh, I hope that this uh, kind of review will do kind of justice. I, I tried to summarize and organize content, so uh, <laughs> we'll have a talk and we'll in the cryo chambers of the of the ship by the ship AI because uh, uh, some alien life forms. Uh, which the AI calls intruders, because of course IP is a thing, uh, have breached the ship. So you have to deal, to deal with, the, in, with the intruders, the possible damage they did, and possibly make it back safely to Earth. And this is basically the, the, the setting of the game. Now, what is extremely cool in this game is uh, that that, that this game is a semi-cooperative one. Uh, very well game is uh, that, that that this game is a semi-cooperative one. Uh, very well th thought in this uh, in this aspect, because uh, every player gets uh, two objectives when it when they get awakened. Uh, of course, you start by drafting from when they get awakened. Uh, of course, you start by drafting from a possible pool of characters you could get. So you don't have the complete choice, but you have a fair choice about characters like the soldier, the medic, the scout, the scientist. Now now I uh, I was about to say the prisoner, but this is from one expansion. So uh, you just have plenty of characters with special abilities and a custom deck of special action cards and some gear that only they have and can use at least at start even two objectives and uh, you win if you complete one now what what is uh, uh, what is cool about this is that you are given two objectives one is usually a kind of community objective so something that you can do in full cooperation but it is kind of bit of a, and it could not be achieved at all in the very few rounds of the game the other is a corporate uh, objective which is usual which usually means doing arm to one of the other players just one and this is the cool part uh, start and you could decide to pursue any of these two but when you have the first encounter with uh, uh, an intruder you are forced to discard one of the objectives so basically you awaken you start to understand what's up and what's going on 
and at some point someone encounters an alien and uh, when they do you are forced to discard one objective and pursue just one of these which will be your victory condition now what does this mean this means that uh, player count i'd say four players for example uh, you know that you can trust most of the people except possibly one which could uh, who could need to kill you so uh, you can reasonably expect to cooperate and the game is operate to have a chance at achieving your objective and uh, for the rest you have to watch out because uh, at any moment uh, the the scientist for example could lock you in uh, inside uh, inside the chamber with the queen so um uh, uh, that's basically uh, the, the fascination of the game uh, you have a goal the goal is secret and uh, you are basically cooperating but at some point the, the, the backstab the betrayal is, uh, is around the corner uh, the game plays uh, reasonably quickly in every turn because you, you are dealt basically end of five cards uh, uh, the more you go on with the game, uh, the more your deck gets polluted with contamination cards which you cannot use and uh, you can perform a selection of actions like move around, uh, activate uh, stuff in the, in the room you are in and, uh, and uh, fight intruders and something like that. Uh, but uh, you have to discard cards to do that. You can also use the actions of the card which are the action for your uh, for your character and uh, after that you uh, there, there's a player face and then you move the uh, the intruders okay and uh, basically you have a success of these turns until you uh, either everyone dies which could happen or you uh, or all your players decide to go back to cryo chambers because their objective is kind of completed and uh, uh, or uh, everyone is expected by the escape pods or the ship self-destroyed or something like that now uh, since uh, talking about this game is uh, this game has a lot of opportunities i think that uh, we can give examples of how this narrative is good so uh, i think everyone played this game so i think we can shout it no i didn't play it <laughs> i really like uh, nemesis 2 uh, ip infringing aspect besides i feel like the base game has more than enough content um, but if there's one expansion that i would wholeheartedly recommend it would be the script book, I think that's the name, uh, which adds a uh, which adds a sort of campaign layer to the game, which with specific objective and a comic book that illustrates certain events. So you play the game normally, but some of the in-game events are scripted and affect the following games. Uh, it's a lot of fun and adds some structure to the game. That, structure to the game. That is exactly. Yeah. That, that is exactly the one expansion I would recommend. That's the one that, one of the ones that's hardest to get as well. Yeah, <laughs> I have it. It's actually fun and it makes playing solo a, a thing. So, uh, sorry then. Uh, this game is, uh, is really, really cool because uh, it can happen uh, everything uh once uh, i i got the scientist and uh, i i got the the objective the goal to uh just have someone survive then go to earth uh so i i basically escorted the escorted the mechanic around everywhere i i took care of everything i opened doors i closed the doors i was uh, extra caring with the mechanic and it happened uh, when i escorted him uh, escorted him uh, it seemed that the entire monsters were uh, were uh, behind us because we, we we were basically followed by everything and we we escaped barely for a lot of time and uh, 
at some point since the soldier died somewhere else in the for a lot of time and uh, at some point since the soldier died somewhere else in the ship uh, the escape pods opened so that the scout uh, went directly there and escaped through an escape pod now since uh, it seemed that way uh, that we were through an escape pod now since uh, it seemed that way uh, that we were uh, 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 hit by, by a string of bad luck uh, I just uh, ran away and left the mechanic there with the closed doors to die and I took that when the mechanic horribly died, horribly, horribly died I, I found out that he, he was out to kill me and return to earth so basically uh, everything was happening because he was making noise choosing the wrong rooms and doing stuff um, attempting to repair but uh, he, he actually was trying. basically i i tried to to help the traitor kill me <laughs> oh another th another time i exited uh, right out of the cryo chambers uh, went directly into the uh, the intruder nest and spawned the queen and i got killed uh, like immediately well, that's called facing the consequences of your, of your actions, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, th this is actually uh, highlights something of the downside of this game. But if uh, if you if you people have stories, uh, I will keep the downside for later because I still want to get my tented grape pledge, so I won't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, um, I haven't had a chance to play this pledge, so I won't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to play this as much as I would like. It kind of... Uh, I couldn't manage to get to the lockdown Kickstarter in time. It, it sort of drifted by me. I own basic, I own the base game of the Board Game Geek, um, board game geek um, promos. Um, and that's more or less it. I will say, as this is always important to note, the insert is incredible. Sometimes ah. Awakened Realms don't do the best inserts, but the one for Nemesis is like really good. The only... If you're going to make a fully plastic one, it needs to be really good, or don't bother. And they, <laughs> you know, this isn't something you're going to throw out. I I looked at it and I went, you know what? I don't need a third party insert. I don't need a wood one or a a cardboard one or whatever. It's this is this is it. And um, it does, yeah. Or, or in my clan because uh, they, 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 they got the, um, they, they got the carnomorphs or so, or the necromorphs basically. They are very much um, non-IP infringing death place monster. Yes, yes, they are. Um, I, I want to say, uh, most of my experience playing this game has been three-player, and it's one of the more impressive three-player, and it's one of the more impressive traitor-based three-player games I've played. Um, I'm hoping to play Mantis Falls, which uh, eventually might um, also join that illustrious list. But I, it's because you don't know for sure if there is going to be someone who's looking to betray everyone. Uh, so it keeps the ten try everyone. Uh, so it keeps the tension going. Whereas normally, once you know who a traitor is within a given game, it kind of collapses down onto sides. Uh, and here, it, it never really does. You're not quite sure. Um, you don't know. You got to kind of cooperate, but you 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 could be in your own demise when you do. I think that's fantastic. Uh, great bit of tension. Th that's the smartest part of the game. You you uh, even if you can be a traitor, you are never a complete traitor. So you can still trust other uh, other players. And also, the game is so uh, nobody wins. So you have to cooperate, otherwise uh, nobody will win. And uh, when you're cooperating, you are just never completely sure that you can trust your ally. Mm. I um, I really, really love the infected scanning mechanic, which is a great physic. Just that you, you get these um, contamination cards and then you have to go to a place to get them scanned and you put them into like a little red filter thing that will reveal if you are infected or not is just fantastic or you can just gamble and and take the risk and then discover you're infected at the end of the game and be like oh dear yes you have to check for infection you have to check for coordinates you have a lot of checks and the, the infection part is very cool because you actually uh, 
accumulate those cards because you get a few. I think I, I never ended the game without a couple of them. But uh, in the end you could just be infected and in most cases you w would just lose with that. Not in objectives. Yeah, they are. They, uh, it feels like they're also, through these expansions, the lockdown and everything, they're building a whole universe here, which is very um, interesting. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, lockdown is the second Kickstarter, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, uh, that actually is. Uh, I don't know if it is a sh if it has a ship yet. No, no, no. Okay, B because it was ranked uh, like sixty six six thousand on BGK. B because it was ranked uh, like sixty six six thousand on BGG. I said it's very it's very close to some of it being shipped, um, and then the rest is supposed to be September twenty twenty one. Um, it, um, it has uh, interesting concepts, there's uh, multi-interesting concepts, there's uh, multi-level scenarios that, uh, that that I want to see, uh, really. Yeah. And, uh, okay, I if we want to talk a bit about the expansions, I I'll just shortly recap them. Uh, you have the comic book, which is uh, a narrative addition to, uh, addition to the game, and it's cool because it uh, gives you a, a significant solo mode and there's a, a, sto a branching story which is a, a bit of kind of campaign mode it is a small rule book it fits in the core box even with uh, the default insert which is a good insert and uh, it's my actually it's my only recommendation of the nemesis expansions because uh, uh, the other two big expansions uh, we which were optionals and the one uh, ended up being a kickstarter reward um, they are void seeders which are the free one and they they are basically psychic alien uh, like like a kind of products but uh, not not them and like the space man flayers or something like that i'm keeping in infringing ips ips so i, yeah. I stop here Al alexis called them cthulhu-esque which is a fair description yes they add the panic mechanic which is kind of smart but they had a bit too much var variance and uh, in this game it's uh, it's not a good thing because this game has lots lots of randomness and so you end up uh, because the core game is more than enough on the other hand there are the carnomorphs which are kind of uh, Intruders which evolve by eating uh, corpses and they get special powers. Uh, I don't have this uh, this this one expansion. Uh, a complaint about it is that it makes the game longer, and this is uh, a thing you don't want because in three players a game rarely lasts less than three hours. So uh, it's actually a lot of game. I have played the Nemesis for four, four hours, four hours and a half, and uh, I have to say you don't want to prolong the game too much. And this is why the last expansion, which is uh, which is Aftermath, Aftermath has super cool characters which have interesting powers, unique powers. There's this, and they are perfectly integrated in which have interesting powers, unique powers. There's this and they are perfectly integrated in the core game but i have to say uh, you have the epilogue mod in which you uh, descend the nemesis if you manage to survive and it adds uh, like you uh, descend the nemesis if you manage to survive and it adds uh, like one hour of game to the game when you completed the game so it's actually uh, painful to go by that so uh, characters are super super cool and promoted but the rest of the expansion is... in that expansion there's the cat the first player model yeah <laughs> space cat yeah they got four different space cats as well in the in the kickstarter there's a catamorph and another catanaut and everything um to counterbalance while i do agree that they make the game longer and that the base game has already a game and they are all fun. I don't think that there's an expansion that I would say is, is not working with the game. 
if you really enjoy the game after buying the, the first one and uh, the script book, I would recommend getting uh, Aftermath and then uh, the other two. Uh, I, I think that they're both equal. I think that they're both equally as fun. Yeah, actually, probably my recommendation would be uh, you will be okay with uh, with just the core game. You you will be okay forever. But if you love Nemesis, if you know you can make like uh, um, 20 games, be okay forever. But if you love Nemesis, if you know you can make like uh, um, 20 games in a year of a, a Nemesis, just get an expansion because it, it, it will change your game enough to, to, to have it uh, always new and have something that you'll enjoy. You, you can find it uh, always new and have something that you'll enjoy. You, you can find the stuff you'll enjoy because th that's it with Awaken Realms. Th that's one single mechanical point in each expansion which is good and smart and cool. The, the, the real problem with expansions is that the rest of the expansion is not uh, exactly complement which pitch did. So, uh, actually, uh, now the, this is the part I, I, I beg uh, Awaken Realms to not listen to, because I, I have to say a couple things uh, which could be issues for the potential buyer of Nemesis. No, no, I never said that. So, uh, the, the first thing is this game works uh, on the high player counts. If you can play in 4 and in 5, you will probably have fun anyway. Uh, why is that? Because uh, you need to have uh, uh, objectives uh, which force you. Because uh, when the first pe when the first person die, you unlock the escape pods. So uh, if you are playing two or three, and you are just uh, kill uh, player two, and escape, uh, you are probably done, and the game is not fun for for anyone. Uh, player count to play, even except you are going with the comic book and the solo mode which is cool uh, and the game is very very long and uh, it gets longer with the, with the player count so uh, this is actually an unavoidable thing which is cool because the game is it creates creative i think this is the best the best emergent nar narration i ever got for for a game because the the, the uh, quantity and quality of stuff which could happen and which could be justified by the story is uh, is enormous i, I think uh, i i didn't pre sort combination of objectives even having may having done uh, more than 20 games so uh, this is very replayable very interesting you have to uh, tolerate to die on the first turn for the story because this is the thing that happens I think I died the first turn, at least. Uh, so, uh, so this is a thing that happens. The, the, the first, the first player going out is uh, becomes the intruder controller, and they can decide move decide movement for the intruders. So uh, you make the game harder for the others because you you will get a, a total bust. So uh, you make the game harder for the others because you you will get a, a total bastard in do, in, in being that. But uh, uh, the second player would die. Is, uh, well, that sucks. So uh, it's okay if you die 80% of the game in, but it's very, very unfun. Okay, if you die 80% of the game in, but it's very, very unfun when you die first turn, and it happens because there's a lot, because there's a lot of randomness, and you end up uh, with a random selection of rooms, so you don't know. So you don't know where where you are going, and you could end up in the nest, for example, <laughs> and get locked in and die. Well, that's the risk you play with any kind of game like this. You don't play uh, an alien or aliens themed style game without understanding character death is going to happen. Um, it's the shame ends <laughs> like a horror in space where character death is possible. Same, like I think Deep Madness handles this a little better. It has a lot of thematic similarities, but if anyone dies, it's game over. However, Deep Madness is a purely cooperative experience, so that's a difference there. It's the kind of thing where maybe you just want to be like that kind of thing. 
I think that it wouldn't have been too hard to get a to give a separate uh, body of rules for a player to play as an intruder, and when someone dies, they get to have some actions and some uh, extra content to do as the um, the game master. I think that there there could be some master. I think that there there could be some fun to be had there. If you want to enjoy an emergent narrative, if you want to enjoy a story told across your, told by your actions and a, a, a cool traitor mechanic, get it because this was the, the best that I think this is still the best. I, I don't uh, I don't think there's a, a traitor mechanic so developed. Uh, it uh, remember me the thing in a couple infection attack was 31 I mean in a couple of interactions but of course here you are completely inside this. you are risking your life and uh, the fact that you could that, that could put you off because you are risking your life is actually what makes the game what makes the game compelling so uh, if your uh, gaming group wants to enjoy a session when they create a compelling story this is the game for you yeah if you want the theme and you want the experience, but you want a purely cooperative game where also player elimination isn't necessarily the end because there are backup characters, you could play Gale Force is um, a rendition of Aliens. Miniatures are not as good, but it is the original story. Um, it is, um, you get to play as all the classics from the movie, but you control a full squad of like eight Marines. And if you suffer someone, the hero's dying, you get to step at one of the other grunts as a hero. So they have a bit more kind of, that's an alternative there. Uh, it's probably talk about it at some point. Yeah, yes, that, that's actually again. Yeah, yes, that, that's actually again to talk about, especially since uh, this is another downside of Nemesis, uh, a little one if you want, but uh, it could happen that after playing four hours, nobody wins. Right. Well, I think that's all we have time for on Nemesis. Right. Well, I think that's all we have time for on Nemesis. Uh, we're going to stay up in the big black void with weird, weird, gribbly creatures. But instead of uh, being on board a ship, they're going to be on a planet, having crash landed in the two-player cooperative, the two-player cooperative game, Far Away. Designed by Alexander Jerebek and uh, released on Kickstarter and later on in stores by Cherry Picked Games. This might be my pick for two player game of 2021. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but nothing's come close to the joyous experience and how cozy this game is. So. You are both uh, members of the Federation Alliance, which is a horribly bureaucratic uh, organization. They go out to map, uh, ships are expendable, materials are expendable, we'll just chuck some more bodies out at the problem is kind of their um, attitude towards you. So you're almost completely disposable. This game has one of the hardest mechanics, uh, I think, to get to grips with um, for a two player game in that hex so you have to group up make your plans uh have a little hug uh because otherwise the astronauts will die from loneliness they will um and then go off your separate ways to carry on with, on with your plans you can see what your partner is doing but they're supposed to play their their go in complete silence um for missions i'll talk a little bit about the starting mission which is a simulation and that one's that you're encouraged you can talk when playing that one because to learn the rules you're gonna need to talk uh, effectively your ship crash lands as it always does and you're there in the crash site ship's not working anymore most missions you have to fix it to get out of there but to fix it to get out of there but for the the simulation doesn't matter you've got the job of deploying three radio masts in a triangle that's going to involve exploring these hexes which represent different biomes each time you reach a new biome you're going to Roll a dice, you might find some resources, you might find some old like find some old like ruins or a natural kind of well front of um well font of 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 resources, or you might find one of the local denizens, or even worse, uh, a den they live in. And um this game has I've uh, something like forty odd different creatures 
They're all represented by little tokens. They're all represented by little tokens. They are simultaneously the best and the weakest part of the game. Um, the other interesting part of this mechanic is you've got like you can move, you can build stuff, you can gather stuff, you can um, fight an animal. You might domesticate the animal instead of fighting it. Maybe you know have your own little pet, which you can maybe you know have your own little pet, which you can ride, or you can hug it so you don't feel so lonely. Um, loneliness is quite an issue in this game. Uh, it, it is, yeah. Basically, um, these astronauts die if they starve, which um, they have to eat every five turns, or if they end up loneliness, which also has a if they end up loneliness, which also has a five turn counter on it. So typically, you can only spend about four turns away from someone before regrouping in. Luckily, the the astronauts can travel long distances on already explored maps, so you can get back together quickly. But uh, it's it's still it's always sort of ticking away there and it's nice the way it's always sort of ticking away there and it's nice the way the game as you plan go apart do your separate stuff come back together time for the next round of planning uh right what's i saying um yeah so it's it's a sandboxy lots of different actions you can do exploring meeting new creatures some of which are docile and friendly some of which are quite opportunistic some are territorial uh, and they, there's a ton of character put into this game. It's got a whole retro feel to it. It feels very 1960s, and I adore the obvious disdain that Mission Control has for you on the missions. Like, you know, the mo at, shoot them at the planet, and maybe they'll survive the impact. Uh, the, th I, like, the problem with this game, and I think that this is the caveat, is... The creatures, as I said, sort of, they're the weakest portion. Gone for this, uh, this aesthetic of like a xenobiologist's sketch. Um, and so they're, they're this little like piece of paper with this line drawing on it. It looks great on the card. However, on the chits, it's exactly the same. You have no identifying outline. You have you have a very small, like one centimeter by one centimeter, slightly bigger than that chit. And you'll it's yeah. And you've got you've got like twenty baggies of them, or 30, 40 baggies of these that you're trying to figure out which particular group you need to pull to have. And the only identifiers that are really visible are the size. The only identifiers that are really visible are the size, which is the bottom left corner and whether they're wandering or a den monster. Some of them look kind of similar, um, and and so it's it's a problem and it becomes fiddly. It's not. Uh, insurmountable but i think they could have done better on the design interface but i think they could have done better on the design interface like say like a a, a silhouette printed on each in the top right corner would have made it a lot easier to identify the other thing is some of the colors are a bit too similar uh there's this hex symbol with a number in it and the color on the hex tells you what in it and the color on the hex tells you what kind of biomes the creature likes to live in so if it's not in one of those it might wander over to be there if it is there it might stay under normal light which you know is slightly yellowish you can't identify the blue or the green apart at all so you're sort of sitting there and some of the some of the hexes are split blue green to that some of the hexes are split blue green to say this likes being in a blue or a green uh, a number of times I had to, so the number of times I had to get like a pure white light out and flash it on a card to be like, ah, actually it goes here was a, an, an issue. All of these are fixable, like it's just design problems. All of these are fixable, like it's just design problems. The one thing that some people might have difficulty with is this game kind of asks you to role play the creatures. It gives you. Um, a description of what their behavior is and how uh, how they like to th and it shows what kind of food they like they like to th and it shows what kind of food they like whether they're carnivorous herbivorous herbivorous uh, omnivores or scavengers um, and it also tells you like how far they tend to roam how far they can see uh, and things like that but it's not some people if you're going to game the system you can kind of like be well this creature even though it's carnivore it's it's you know it's not going to attack me it's going to attack these easy easy herbivores and constantly so you have to you almost have to give yourself a bit of the difficulty and i think that could have been better they could have programmed a better 
AI flowchart carnivore have a little set of they will they will choose the astronauts first then herbivores second they will avoid other carnivores or whatever that would have been nice but I've played a load with games with AI I've programmed AI for me I just sat down and worked out a load of rules with the, the AI and the game just sings it's so like cozy it's the only way to describe it it's such a relief when you've been out walking around and you get back into the same hex as, as your partner you're playing with and you're just like finally we can talk finally you know <laughs> like finally you know <laughs> like that was horrible or look at me now I've, i'm riding a, a six-legged dinosaur you know it's um i i i really was impressed with this game it, it could be better I would call it like a 7 to 8 out of 10. I would call it like a 7 to 8 out of 10. But for the game experience, I adored it. So I'm the person who's played this here. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Actually, uh, I have one big question. Component count. Actually, uh, I have one big question. Component count. Component count? Oh, good luck. Good, good luck. Uh, I can't even get the components to fit back in the box properly without the box bulging slightly. Uh, it's it's hundred like like there's loads of hex tiles. Uh, it's it's hundred like like there's loads of hex tiles. Um, there's loads and loads of different creatures. Uh, seven different missions which have multiple different sub objectives. So you can replay a mission and not and and it can pan out entirely differently with you even doing different stuff during the mission. And yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of components. I think that I read that the playtime is around two hours long. Um, is that right? How does that match with what you've experienced? It depends on the mission. Um, the starting like learning mission you could probably have done within thirty minutes. Um, the longer mission, three hours maybe. A part of that is a bit out of your control because you move into hexes while exploring. You have to roll a dice to see what's located in that hex. If you're looking for a specific resource, you need to find the right hex and then have that resource spawn on the hex. So you can be in a situation where you're looking for a long time to find it along the way, uh, which can cause things to drag a bit. There's not a mechanic to help you get to your objectives. If they're not there, they're not there. It's a bit 1980s, 1990s in game design on that front. I'm uh, reading the publisher's description. It is, uh, it is actually full of irony. I love it. <laughs> it is actually full of irony. I love it. Yeah, yeah, they, they they do a whole little training video thing, and uh, even in the missions, the text on them telling, describing about like successes and failures and everything, you can get the mission control just kind of really doesn't quite like you, doesn't really care, quite like you, doesn't really care about what you're up to, just like Ugh. I didn't expect you to succeed, but well, well done, I guess. <laughs> yeah yeah it's um it's it's kind of just uh, there's a bunch of dens of carnivals nearby and you just run to the hills to get away from it thinking please don't attack our lander <laughs> you know give us a break um because if the lander gets trashed you will lose because you can't get home but other times you're just wandering around like you know looking at a herb of big big cute cuddly maybe they like being on their own so when you move into a hex it kind of the creature just kind of waddles away to a nearby location and sort of stares at you judging and it, that's it's got so much emergent story and and life to it it's it's quite brilliant really but as i uh, as i mentioned it is very much the players bring to the way the creatures behave if you're gonna metagame min max this kind of thing uh you could easily be like well i'm going to stand in these bunch of herbivores then in comes the carnivore it's going to attack one of the herbivores why would it attack me i'm dangerous and you could be in no danger for the whole game and that's it's not really in the spirit i think it's not really in the spirit i think um yeah it's uh i i it just makes me happy yeah uh, so sit back and enjoy your game basically yeah, sit back, enjoy your game, have fun with the missions.
Um, and the, the visions are very varied. There's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different things you're doing, which is like it's enjoyable. A lot of different buildings to construct. Sometimes you're just like doing scientific research. I think on one of them you're um, penning in some animals, like for to build a little zoo or something. It's um, sweet. Yeah, and forty dollars. Mm, yeah, it's not expensive, but when you get a lot of components and product, and the the quality of them's really good. Like nice high glossy chits, very thick, solid cards. I have I didn't feel any need to sleeve anything. It's great. Or two player game of the year. Is this a while to go? You know, it could get usurped. Um, it's as I say, it's not perfect, but I don't think uh, I've had such a fun experience outside of playing sleeping gods so game of the year so far yeah i'm uh, i'm a bit sad there isn't like a online isn't like a online um copy somewhere that I, I couldn't find one anyway for people to have a go playing and it seems to be out of stock at the um at the shop but you might be able to pick up one somewhere and so it's not an expensive game um and uh, it doesn't play as well solo uh, definitely a big part of well solo uh, definitely a big part of the enjoyment is this forced rule of not talking when you're not in the same hex because it, it it sort of adds a little bit more randomness because you you might be like oh if i just deviate off the original plan a little bit i can just go and do this but that may throw everything off for the other person who suddenly looks and may throw everything off for the other person who suddenly looks and sees you step a hex or two away from where you agreed to go and be like what are you doing and all you can see is the look on their face. Makes me think a bit of another uh, game that I tried recently. It's a two-player game. Uh, it's the work of the crab. A uh, two-player game. Uh, it's the work of the crab. And you, you can't really talk. You have to communicate with things at that moment. And you, you have this, oh no, he's doing that moment. But it happens in many other games anyway. Yeah, it's always fun when a game put in... Uh, puts in an additional constraint on the players. Yeah, it's always fun when a, a game put in, uh, puts in an additional constraint on the players that normally you take for granted. Uh, and this one, I think, as well, is it helps stop quarterbacking um, because while you can be together and one person is driving all the plans, once you're off on your own, you know, you're, you're once you're off on your own, you know, you're you're on your own, and they're not, they're not supposed to say anything. Even if you'd go like, well, that's nice, but I'm gonna go. I, I'm gonna go like wrestle with this animal and try and domesticate it for a bit because uh, I want a pet. That might be what I like doing. Maybe you've only got one in six chance of domesticating an animal, and half you've only got one in six chance of domesticating an animal, and half the time it attacks you. But uh, it's worth it, you know. The riding rules are such fun. So you you don't play the animal, but you can domesticate by mechanics, not just because you decide it's domesticated. No, no, you will. Uh, it will basically, whenever a creature attacks you, you have to roll some because your suit is very well designed to protect you, but it burns up your reserves. Sometimes you get wounded, which is a disaster because you get a wound card, two wound cards, you're dead. Always. One wound card usually cripples you with some crazy downside that you have to deal with for the rest of the mission. And then one in six times, the, the creature just goes, oh, actually, yeah, it, it is. And say so if they're bigger than you, you can ride them. If not, you can um, have them with you and effectively control them as if they're following commands, send them off to collect things for you or fight things. It's, uh, it's pretty neat when it happens, but it doesn't happen often. Okay. And uh, that's all we have time for this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Standy or as The Last Standy on Twitter. And until next time, we've been The Last Standy. So goodbye from Alexis. From Belgium. Goodbye. Goodbye from Alessio. Goodbye from me. And T from David. And goodbye from myself. And remember that the second E in Standy is for eggs. Ooh. All three games have eggs in them. <laughs> <laughs>